Good afternoon. My name is Tom McCallum. This is this week's show of What Comes Next Live. Our topic is always what comes next. And today's guest I've met through an introduction to the weareliminal.co community, um, Stephen Hicks, who has some fantastic, shall we say, viewpoints um, around what comes next. And to open it up, the one definition of the word liminal is to be on the threshold of something to be in the space between one space and another. Um, I've looked a little bit at Stephen's work and um, I put it out to the liminal community for, for, for a guest for this week. And Stephen leapt into the fray. So um, I'm fascinated to hear your views on what comes next, Stephen. So over to you. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Tom. It's a really nice chance to be able to uh, discuss some things about the type of work that I get involved in, in, a, in an area, in a time that we're living in where many of us are changing, not just our jobs necessarily, but the way we interact, the way we see the world and how that, primarily how that allows us to come up with new ways to consider our, our forms of interaction with each other. And that's really something that's been very, uh, very dear to me. So I, uh, I come from Australia, if that's not apparent to a lot of people already, and I came over here uh, 15 years ago or so on a, just on a, yeah, on a whim. Um, but the last, the last 10 years or so, I've worked at Oxford University as a uh, lecturer and a researcher there looking at ways of improving vision for people who are sight impaired. Mm -hmm. And that's been a, uh, something, uh, something of a, a passion where I've been able to blend the technological innovations that are necessary to produce something which is uh, small and elegant and useful with a, you know, with a, a, a necessary use case as well. I guess what I, I sort of discuss a little bit over here is my work in, in visual impairment, uh, leading into some of the work that I'm doing now, now that I, like many of us work from home and think about the world in a slightly different way, which kind of opens up some opportunities for uh, taking uh, new technologies and allowing people new experiences. So what made that um... Uh, what made visual impairment and finding ways to support people with visual impairment a passion for you? What drives that? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, one way I worked in neuroscience and uh, came from a medical background as well. So we always look for areas of technological development that can help people. So you, we might understand like the area of augmented reality and virtual reality, which are primarily gaming or entertainment type experiences. Mm -hmm. But um, that sort of technology can actually be used for people who have, uh, have sight impairment, visual impairment, and use that to augment vision in the same sort of way that we might imagine how a hearing aid was developed to amplify certain frequencies of sound for people who are hard of hearing. Similar things can happen for the for different types of visual impairment where you wanna be able to boost the visibility of certain types of objects. And that's a natural kind of amplifier, a natural kind of application of what's generally consumer playful tech into an area which is uh, more practical so it gave me a chance to really develop and explore uh, work. Uh, also get grants, which was uh, you know, the way to fuel research. And then um, and ultimately just to find a, a niche in a, in a pretty busy technical world, which I could uh, become an expert in and I could help grow an area because you know, I'm, I'm here, for, here for a short period of time to develop the things that I can. I'm, uh, just, I, I always have kind of a passion to develop things that will be useful and entertaining and mm -hmm. ultimately provide uh, joy and delight for people. So that's something which uh, working in a in an eye hospital uh, naturally sort of congregated towards vision. And I mean, I lost, uh, you know, I, I realized I was short sighted at some period through my life and that uh, getting glasses and realizing the world was much sharper and clearer than I saw it was um, mm -hmm. it inspired me to go down a whole uh, pattern of work for visual neuroscience. So understanding mm -hmm. the great mystery of how we form um, the visual world around us. So from a... Um... I won't go further on the uh, on delve further into my question, um, which you've partly answered. But uh, I love entrepreneurial thinking about finding gaps. But what I find is that uh, most entrepreneurs, and you're being entrepreneurial, you're finding a niche, you're finding a place you can work in, make a difference. Um, they've got a powerful driver somewhere, mm. and increasingly in the world we live in, it's beyond making money. It's about making a difference, or perhaps both. Um, so my language is often when you get clear on the why, the how is easy. <laughs> um, yeah. So th that's the, a piece. And having looked a little bit at um, the glasses you're developing, which uh, look forward to you sharing sharing with us, I'm reminded a little bit. If I shoehorn this into leadership a little bit, um, yeah. 
I'm a huge fan of the, the work of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, which um, for those who want to get it in a story form, it's very entertaining. Michael Lewis, who wrote Moneyball and other such um, best-selling books, which became movies, um, did a book, which I don't think will be a movie, which is called The Undoing Project. It's about their friendship, and it tells story after story after story. Um, one of the ones I find it, uh, very interesting is about tunnel vision. Because that's uh, that's also a heuristic, an unconscious bias, a shortcut, and how we all have all of those. But actually how um, the understanding of how fighter pilots see things mm. has become really evolved over time. And that really I identified with because I've had very poor eyesight um, since I was young. Um, mm. But oddly enough, I've been also very blessed that correct my corrected eyesight up until I got a bit older in my late 40s was razor sharp and even beyond right. a level of razor sharpness in that I was, uh, without much training, I was uh, a marksman who could, I literally did um, outshoot some of the best uh, shots in the British army. Um, right. And people say, well, how did you do that? But actually when they looked at me, they went somehow or other, you're able to see a target razor sharp at a distance of 400 yards. Hmm. I started to yeah. study this and realizing that there is some science around that and how um, and then you have to, ex you, you literally can't see anything beyond the center of your field of view at an yes. extreme level. And fighter pilots can be like that. And they just can't see the hillsides yeah. because they're looking yeah. at something that's coming at them faster than the speed of sound. So I kind of looked at that and it's both, um, you know, on a selfish standpoint, I'd love um, you to explain how, how the human eye and the brain works on that. And then perhaps just link that into um, the work you're doing and, and, um, and also just a broader sense of, you know, what's coming next for us and yeah, what can we do? Yeah, no, it's excellent. It's a really nice, really nice place to start. I think when, uh, when I did uh, psychology back in undergraduate, there was a, always a debate about what's the, what's the process of attention in the, in the brain or the mind, however you want to use the term. And there's no real definition for it because attention is a human construct. It's not a biological thing. So it doesn't really exist, but it's a tool and it's a heuristic for how to describe how to apply the appropriate amount of mental energy to solve some particular task. And right. Can you say that again? Sorry? Can you say that again? Oh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> or close to it. It's worth repeating. So it's, a, it's a heuristic about how to apply the, the appropriate amount of met, mental energy to solve a particular task. Brilliant. And so say you've got in your scenario where you're really fixated on one particular thing, there's a, there's a huge amount of processing power that can be brought to bear. You know, about half of the brain is devoted to vision in some sense, wow. not just the perception of lines and colors, but also the prediction of where objects will be and the, mm. um, the imagination of, of what things could potentially happen and, and also the, the salience and the valence of different objects. So as you focus more and more on a particular thing, um, that becomes your entire world. And we've all experienced that looking at our phone. You, know, you look at that and you can be wrapped in that, you know, five inch diagonal thing there, oblivious to the rest of the world, forgetting that it's you know, only several fingers in terms of width across. But we like the fighter parts, we forget all the rest of that. And I think that's one of the things that really, that sort of wraps, the, the thing that's always fascinating me about vision is that we don't necessarily see the world like a video camera does. We don't capture pixels, you know, equally across the entire spectrum. Mm. We choose where we want to look. We, you know, our eyes, uh, as, as I had in my, my previous, in my, in my TED video, um, it's about the fovea, the central part of your eye is about the size of your thumb at your, at your arm's reach. And that's really where all you get your high spatial frequency, all the lines and the contrast and where you get color as well which is a tiny amount of the almost 200 degree field of view that you have around you. But yet I don't see the world as a tiny little, you know, looking down through right. like a cardboard tube. It's, it would serve me no function to see the world as my eye sees it. The way I do see it is I extrapolate all the information that's around me, all the vague shadows and my memory of things around me to produce this holistic, stable world. If I didn't have that supporting mechanism to imagine this world that I'm actually in, it would be very strange, you know, to be dark all around me. And, and actually people who have profound tunnel vision do find that. The, you don't, the interesting thing is that once your vision constricts uh, to like a legal type of blindness, maybe sort of 10 degrees across in the middle, it's not, people report, it's not actually black around the outside. It's just not there. So a little bit like 
the, uh, the image of my hand as it moves behind my head, or if you did that at home, what it'd be like as well. It doesn't disappear and go black. It's just kind of not there. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not aware of it. It's just mm -hmm. that that's the size of the, the world that I have. So what happens with people who have tunnel vision is you obviously the, uh, uh, that can be quite clumsy in bumping into objects because it's not that they've, not that they're necessarily aware of a gap in their vision. It's mm. just that uh, their entire world is fixated on a particular part in the center. And that makes it very, very hard to, um, to navigate and to, and to kind of convey the difficulties that you might see. But essentially your brain is there to try to fill in all the gaps around you. And, and what I was, um, where I was, where I became quite interested. So for about uh, seven or eight years, I've been developing uh, what we call smart glasses, essentially computerized glasses that have a camera and a processor and a display that can be worn, not like this. You know, they're not as light as this, obviously, or maybe in 10 years they will be, but they're more like a chunky sort of augmented reality system. And we produce an artificial image, which is captured live in front of the person um, but it's, you enrich the color and you enrich the contrast and you change the size of it to make it useful for somebody. And the, the idea I always had was that the way we see the world is based on these shapes and we construct that image in our mind. A bit like, I like the idea about impressionist painters. You don't try to paint the thing photorealistically. You, you, you paint shadows and you paint light and you build that idea yourself and the brain constructs it. But as I started to make systems like that at university and then finally into the company that I helped start, we could produce really abstract images that showed the world in structural ways that a person who had very limited sight could see. But the, the amusing, th well, the, the thing that was a struggle was that people didn't want to see the world that way. People would, I had a scenario with a, a woman who was sort of 35 years or so. She could, she was looking at a table. She could see objects on there. With, with the glasses that I'd made, but without them, everything disappeared. Hmm. But even though she could get a definite benefit from that, she sort of turned to me and said, yeah, but it's not really real. That's, okay. you know, she was looking at, her, looking at her own life as if watching TV. And while that afforded a, uh, an improvement in certain types of object identification and hand-eye uh, hand coordination, it didn't match with her, the way that her worldview was, which is, a real, which is a very much, uh, which, was a, which is a blow because, you know, you think about, the brain is just going to sit there and fill in all the gaps and make it all right for you. But you realize that there's an element of reality which is necessary to have alongside that for you to believe and want to engage. I've had people who have shown high contrast edges to be able to navigate in low lights and be able to see much better. But um, people have said, like, I don't want to see the world that way. Oh, obviously, what everyone would like who's got some kind of um, uh, seriously disturbed vision would be to see the world in a rich way, like a magnifier. But once you start getting a computer and start interpreting mm. that, you add this kind of layer, which the brain, while it can intellectually identify objects, it's difficult to make that into a naturalistic experience that somebody would just uh, automatically build into their reflexive, intuitive world. So if we, part, if we pause for a moment, that, that's fascinating around, you said they have to believe and want to engage with it. And this two personal thoughts for me is I, I played basketball at a pretty decent level in my 20s, in my early 20s. And one of the things we had to be taught was to, was to actually use our eyes differently. Mm -hmm. We had to be taught, if you were a guard at the top of the key playing, playing defense and there was somebody in front of you that you were defending, guarding, um, you didn't focus right on them. Yeah. Then you yeah. didn't see everything else. You were actually taught to soften your focus. So this yeah. is the reverse of tunnel vision. So you're not actually focusing on what's in front of you, but you're consciously engaging your peripheral vision. So I was exactly. using the 200 degrees. Yeah. If you so want I find, to- I find uh... that interesting. And the, the second thought that plays into this, right? but I had, to, I had to want that. I had to want to not focus in front of me because I saw the benefit. Um, the other one is I've, um, I have slight hearing loss in one ear, all right? A slight amount of tinnitus, and a slight amount of hearing loss, all right? And so what that means to me, and there are many millions of people with this who hearing aids, conventional hearing aids do not benefit. Um, but they basically, all it means is, please don't make me sit, try to talk to you in a busy room, mm, yeah. right, a noisy room, like a pub at Christmas. I, I walked out of a network event. I walked in the door and went, I can't stay here because I can't hear anybody. But I've been trying a beta test of a phone-based app because the level of processing power is required to be used through a phone. You can't get it into a hearing aid. Mm. And, it, it's, and they've been evolving it. I've been helping them beta test it and evolving it, evolving it, evolving it. 
but I'm at a point where I know it makes a difference, but I've come to that tiny degree of empathy for people with profound hearing loss. Yeah. That what they hear is not what you and I hear. Yeah. yeah. They actually, if, and the, I have a friend who has a very young daughter who's had profound hearing loss since birth. Of course, they didn't realize till she was 18 months, 24 months old. And they put, um, what do you call the implants where they literally, the battery's like kind of bolted. Yeah, there. the cochlear implants. Cochlear implants. Yeah. So the people with cochlear implants hear, they don't hear, they hear an abstraction of the real world, but it means they can hear. Yeah. But, but if they're from birth, from what, from what I understand, they will actually accept it. Yeah. But if, but if they have profound hearing loss through meningitis or something later in life, it's very, it's very challenging. Plus they will also get things like a sensory overload yeah. Um, because they hear everything amplified. There isn't the fine tuning of what they hear. Um, so I'm just finding that, um, sorry, it's just getting my, me very stimulated to look to understand the, this intersection. You said that like, for example, there's no definition of attention. It's just a heuristic, a shortcut we use. And I love your definition of attention. Um, yeah. But it's fascinating that how, how we know what the processing power is. So I'd imagine people with profound vision loss, if I bring it back to that, have, a, have both a loss of, for example, the physicality of the, the lens or the eye or, or some element of that. Um, but maybe another way of looking at it is they've got a loss of processing power. And yeah. Well, had, the, this uh, linkage between what we want, how our brain and our beliefs and the complexity of, of being a human and neuroscience and how that links to the physical science, that's, it's just fascinating. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Shut well, up. We've, <laughs> we've got a very, uh, we've got a very uh, malleable form. We, mm. can, we can apply our, our, our body, our attention, our senses in a lot of different ways. And you, and you hit on where you are, um, where you try to adapt your visual, like consciously adapt your visual experience to match a different scenario. And one of the main things that people who are going through a, a, a journey of sight loss do is um, the coping strategies that are around there. They're vast. You can, you can, you can get a whole lot more out of your vision than, um, than you would naturally do because most of us don't even think about it. We just look wherever we want and, it's, you know, and that's, that's reasonably good. But where you're talking about the, uh, looking, using your periphery for, you know, for guarding in basketball, the, the, we almost have two different eyes in each of our eyes. We have a central one, which is relatively slow but full of really good detail great for looking at art and faces and reading text mm. then we have the peripheral vision which is much much larger where lots of different uh senses all feed into the same um, output neuron that goes to the brain which makes it really good for night vision mm -hmm. and also makes it really good for, for motion detection mm. so if you want to look at something if you want to react really quickly to something say you're sitting and maybe you shouldn't do this but say you're you're sitting at the lights waiting to you know, drive as fast as you can as soon as the light goes green you shouldn't look directly at the green light because it takes a while for you to do it. But if you look slightly off from that, you can get the uh, you know, the, the change detectors much faster. And you know, uh, has anybody ever taught a racing driver that? Oh, I'm sure they must have learned that already. Yeah, that's yeah, brilliant. Yeah. If they just look 20 degrees off, because you said it's a 10 degree field. If they yeah. look 20 degrees off, yeah, they'll catch it. That yeah, just wait for a tiny little change, and then wow. yeah. And that's what uh, that's what uh, prey animals have. Most prey animals who are laterally, you know, lateral-eyed animals, they don't really have a phobia because there's nothing well, nothing to read for a start because you're a deer. But you know, all you're really looking for is the motion of a jaguar yeah. or something like that. You know, if you're if you're lucky enough, um, so you can react really quickly. Whereas a predator animal has right in the front, they don't have to worry about the periphery because nothing's going to chase them. All they've got to do is look for tiny bits of detail in the distance. Well, what we're lucky, we've got the combination of those two. And like you, like you rightly said, you can train yourself. In certain scenarios, you can look at different ones. And most of those happen through birth. And like you were saying, with, with hearing, with cochlear implants, it's, um, it's one of those things that if it, if it happens within the first year or so of your life, then the, the auditory cortex or, or in vision, the visual cortex is still developing. Mm -hmm. And it's got this sensory, this, uh, this receptive period where it'll, where it'll adapt itself. But after that's all, all formalized, then that's really difficult to change, except for through huge amounts of effort. And it won't be the the, um, the the deep physical change that will happen through birth. It'll be something that you'll always have to work through with physiotherapy and things. Well, if I look at that, um, so I'm playing with this conversation and I can shoehorn some metaphors in here because mm -hmm. you think about predators just can look straight ahead, whereas the prey has to be more focused on the peripheral vision. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the humans are the alpha predator, if not predator. Well, yeah, I think yeah. from an ecological yeah. standpoint, we're the alpha predator of the earth. So we don't really look peripherally. Um, and I find it fascinating that when the US election results were coming out, uh, we knew weeks in advance the way the count would happen. And yet it didn't stop everybody from being narrowly focused on what was happening in that moment. Yeah. Um, and similarly, the second piece you're talking about, about the, 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 challenge around processing different way of hearing or different way of seeing if you've already got deep riverbeds of patterns and behaviors and and the way you're 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 processing matures as you as you grow that's also the world we're living in right now i mean the the Mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs who see opportunities not challenges uh are seeing so many opportunities to rethink the world right now yeah Um, and so many others are, are are challenged so lifting it to leadership for a minute so many others are uh, uh, finding, I just want it to go back to the way it always was. Um, right. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm veering yeah. off. No, I think that's I think that's true. I think there's a, there's a nice grander metaphor than in what you're saying, which is that it pays to have a mixture of of focus, but also you know the stepping, you know, reminding yourself to step back and be a bit blurry, <laughs> you know, yeah. and get a feel for what's going on, because that's one of the worst things that happen in political debates is you stay really fixated on either what your goal is or what your opponent's goal is. But forgetting to find like some sort of amalgam between those, which will allow you to pick up features of things that you hadn't seen before. Hmm. And that sort of broader perspective isn't something that we're going to learn, or well, maybe some people do naturally have that, but it's something which sounds like would be worth teaching or encouraging. The ability to forcefully take 10 minutes out of your day to however you mentally defocus in order to capture a bit of the, uh, you know, the, the vibe around you. Well, I mean, I've watched your TEDx talk and it's great. And, um, you know, I'd love to hear for a couple of minutes as to where you are with the product development and launch. I can also see another, uh, because you're clearly a a wide thinker, uh, I could see another TEDx um, talk coming around uh, extrapolating, to use the word, in a different context Mm -hmm. and then applying what you can learn through that intersection of the human body the physical science the, the physical yeah. bioscience and yeah. the neuroscience and how the, the the mind operates and how people can learn to accept these different processing and as, as we're playing with a metaphor of, of of both focus and peripheral vision so how, yeah. how's the how does, how's the product going steam well yeah i mean so we've only got eight minutes left and i had <laughs> at least <laughs> you haven't minutes. got onto your product <laughs> <laughs> so exactly so we can uh, do this again sometime it'd be, it'd be great um, yes, well, the, the the coronavirus hasn't been uh, kind to our company, like many others as well. Right. So, um, so I've actually so we while we launched some products, uh, particularly for Tunnel Vision, which went very well, we finished developing one for a much larger condition called Macular Generation, mm-hmm. uh, which trialed very well, uh, and the uh, the company is looking to raise funds at the moment to uh, to manufacture and distribute that. So mm-hmm. with, if everything goes right, we can uh, still fulfil our primary goal of producing. Um, yeah, some excellent hardware. But, but what's happened actually is this has freed me up to um, to look at some other projects which have been uh, particularly interest to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the and the one that I've been fascinated again coming from Australia. Um, I've, and and what's particularly relevant now with a lot of us working from home and video con- uh, scenarios like this is the um, is what we what we lack is that ability to get the the more subtle cues, which I guess is also related to to blurry peripheral vision as well. Mm-hmm. About um, you know, when you when you meet with somebody and you want to want to share warmth and connection in meeting with somebody, or just to be able to get a, get a sense of the person they are, or 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 to have a conversation which isn't about a specific goal, but is about sharing a bit of time and seeing what sort of bubbles up naturally. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to work in this area for a long time since uh, having Skype conversations with mum and dad back in Sydney for uh, for fifteen years. All right. And now it's now it's actually got to the stage where we do have the technology to be able to. Uh, move from beyond a 2D screen into a, a, more of a, a sharing of a physical and digital world, which is what a, in the idea about what comes next. That's very, very much what I've been thinking about quite a lot now. How to create a scenario which would allow us to share a physical space, even though we're even though we're physically remote by you know other side of town or other side of the world, and using what we know now from uh, computer vision, uh, wearable displays, and the type of 3D and spherical cameras that have become available, it's only really an option now for us to be able to um, work on ways in which we can bring in some of the some of those more subtle cues 
So I can extract a lot of information from your face right now. And obviously I'll be sharing speech, but it'd be nothing like, you know, Tom, come sitting here next to me, even if you're going to be like a, a relatively see-through sort of holographic type of version. But where, where, I've become, where, where I've become really fascinated about this is that, um, and back to the idea about realism in a, in a visual display, if I did capture some video from you, and there's a lot of computer vision work, which now I could, I could take your face and your shoulders and I could make a, a plausible 3D model of you from you know, using, uh, using some work, um, they're called general adversarial networks, um, GANs, and they can, they can the, the, you know, the area of deep fakes that we've come yes. across. Uh, you can actually use them for good. Yeah. <laughs> I could then I could generate realistic versions of you, which I could then composite into my world around me right now. And I could have uh, an experience where we, where we share a meal together or, or we discuss. But one of the interesting things that I've, that I've come up against is that while I could create that image, I would have to create a lot of, I'd have to generate artificially a lot of things. Like I don't know what your shoes look like. So I'd have to suppose that. And I don't know what your legs look like or what your hand gestures mm -hmm. would be. But would that, would that matter? So if I, if I had you here, but I'd auto-generated what your hands might do, and there's, there's some code already around which can auto-generate uh, gestures based on speech, it maybe wouldn't be the ones that you do, but it would be enough for me to just to fill in that periphery. So I don't want to see you like a floating torso <laughs> in the room. I want to see you as a holistic being. But if I had to create that in information from scratch, would that break the illusion? Would I still be able to say that I've got the benefit of having you in the room if I know that I've actually auto-generated a fair bit of you from scratch? Hmm. And that's one of the things that I think we're going to have to uh, wrestle with because it's an area which is going to be able to allow us to share workspaces more. And if it turns out that we're not able to travel, you know, for another year or potentially, you know, we realize that too much international travel is, you know, is actually not that good for the environment as, as we know, there's always a push to reduce this amount of physical meeting. Yeah. But I'm really focused now in terms of what we need to do to create a, a meaningful experience in terms of what we call telepresence, which would allow us then to be able to have a meaningful experience with, with people that we, uh, that we don't necessarily get to see every day. Wow. And that's a massive what comes next area. And if I look at intersections and overlaps, uh, my, I've been working remotely since it was technically possible with bandwidth. So you're talking 12, 15 years. Um, and you, by having what I guess you call them visually artifacts and other things like shoes, et cetera, by trying to copy it so that people accept it. I also noticed uh, in your background that you in, in, have a real interest in art installations and abstract art. Hmm. Uh, and you, you talked about that earlier today. Um, my sense would be it's, you know, one of the big gaps right now is people are trying to replicate the real world in the online world. Hmm. And the, the, the thing is, how can we create that belief and acceptance of, of presence. Um, for me, I know it's, you know, it's a massive shortcut, um, but the, the, you know, the idea of the rule about tone of voice, body language, and the words you say, and, and the combination, what's it called? The 7%, 38%, 55% rule. And theoretically 7% is that. And it's, of course, it's been, you know, discredited. However, for me, I put it another way. If I've got to know somebody in person, I can get at least 85% of the value of communication as a coach, right? Visually on video. Yeah. I can get maybe 50 to 60% on the phone and much, much less in writing because without, you mentioned emoticons earlier. Yeah. I'm, I'm a 55 year old who uses emoticons because I, I want to clarify my communication. Mm. Yeah. If I've never met somebody, I can get, still get much more on video. So what, what do I actually miss given that I would, you know, look to say I'm a pretty good listener. Yeah. What do I miss? And oddly enough, it's stuff that another thing science isn't brilliant at measuring. Um, neuroscience is still a nascent field, right? For example, yeah. it's energy. Yeah. And, 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 and reading somebody's energy. Whereas yeah. if, I'm, if I'm in person with them, I can sense beyond words, sight, and hearing. I can sense, right, when you go to another the fourth level of listening, if you will. And that sounds really weird and woo-woo, but it's been my practical experience for, for a decade and more. Yeah. So it's, it's a fascinating field that, you know, where do we find the balance? Where do we dimension? Where do we move the soundboard sliders between 
you know, the visual representation, the auditory representation, um, yeah. and, and, and the other potential elements that represent getting as close as possible to 100% of the same communication. Because what you're, you're also talking about are people with good vision, right? Mm. They, they, they're unconscious around it. They don't consciously have an awareness, whereas there must be, while it would be, I can't possibly empathize and understand what it would be like to have go on the little journey of sight loss. Um, I, you know, all I can project is that some people on one extreme of the spectrum will fight it the whole way along and be resistant. And other people will go, actually, I've been told I'm going to fully lose my sight within 18 to 24 months. Hmm. I, I'm going to see the trees and the leaves. I'm yeah. going to see the faces. So they're just more conscious. So as we bring consciousness in the different fields that will intersect on this, that's a fascinating idea because clearly, you know, I've done my carbon footprint with a company called Pawprint that I'm a crowdfund investor in, right? And my carbon footprint is tiny, except for one thing. Pre-COVID, I flew well over 100,000 miles a year. Right, yeah. To go see my clients. Yeah. Every few months, I go see my clients around the world. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah no, sorry, we, have... we could definitely go on for hours. It's very, very cool. Um, I, yeah. The practice I've got into in evolving this, this weekly show is to allow my guests a couple of minutes to wrap up rather than me. <laughs> <laughs> 35 minutes to wrap up, did you say, Tom? Yeah. 35 minutes to wrap up, yeah. <laughs> People will stay, you know. But take, take, a, take two or three minutes and just, uh, what are your thoughts of this conversation and, and what's next for you and what do you see? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating, I mean, I think it's a, it's, it's a never-ending uh, source of inspiration, I think. The, uh, the the type of the type of experiences that we're able to um, get out to to involve ourselves in now. I I play virtual reality with the kids. I look at you know telepresence and augmented reality. My line of work, um, they are very visually based, but they're they're primarily designed to allow people to experience things that they can't normally. And just to just to squeeze my last little bit in because this is my what comes next after I was solved telepresence and done all that sort of stuff. After you've done all that stuff, no problem. Yeah, after you've done all that stuff, is to is to see what it's like to experience actually being in space. And I've loved that as a child. And, mm. the, and the main thing is, uh, as, a, as a colleague of my summit, where we sort of worked on, is the, the beneficial effect of, of the thing called the overview effect. So seeing Earth from orbit mm. is something which, you know, maybe only a couple of hundred people have seen, but they have profound profound experiences of seeing the fragility of the planet, how precious it is, and and how, you know, if there was going to be a heaven, that's it. You know, it, hmm. and these are sort of things that you can, yeah, you can watch the movie Gravity. You can see yep. uh, the lovely blue, but, but seeing it yourself from space is something different. But it's very hard because space is hostile and it's fast and it's a long way away. So if we're able, I think what I'm trying to do is I'm able to produce something which has got a sense of realism in terms of telepresence that I can actually believe, that I actually feel like in my parents' house in Sydney watching the, uh, you know, the cockatoos and things like that. Mm -hmm. Can I translate that over into experiencing what it's like to actually literally be in space and trick my brain into that mm -hmm. and give myself and many, many others the ability to get a holistic view on the world, uh, an, uh, an inherent desire to, to protect and to cherish it. I know we all naturally do, but mm -hmm. there's something profound about seeing the entire curvature of it that seems to change people for good. And that feels to me... Uh, where, that's where I come come next to. Is that it seems like a great gift to lots of people to be able to make it in make it a make it a no brainer that you're going to choose you know certain types of lifestyles over other ones because you've seen you know the the preciousness of the of the, of the globe floating in the void. That's beautiful, and I'm going to break the rule I just put out there, which is that I'm loving this intersection of the known and the the not yet fully known such as neuroscience, how the brain operates. And yeah, that thing about the overview effect, I was lucky enough to fly on Concorde the last year it operated. I saved up some money and thought, this is never gonna happen again in my children's lifetime. And the point at which you get so high up, you can actually see the curvature through the windows. That's how high it flew. Um, but there's no la rational, logical, or explainable reason why. We can try, but it's just a visceral effect. And if that effect can have people, if it can have, as you say, a profound effect, then yeah, that, that's the stuff that goes beyond the intellect. And um, that's a fascinating, that's a, it's a wonderful thing to strive for. And I have the feeling you're going to achieve it. So, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. Absolute thanks, pleasure to meet you, Stephen. And 
I hope to intersect with you in the liminal, we are liminal.co community. What website can we reach you at? Well, I, uh, so I mean, LinkedIn, I can put that on the, uh, the uh, comments in the YouTube. I do have a website, stephenhicks.co.uk, but it's currently down. But uh, <laughs> I see, I see before, in a couple of weeks' time, it'll be up again. But your LinkedIn has a link to your TED, TEDx talk, which is a great start to understanding you. That's a good Thank point. you so much. It's been, an absolute, it's been an absolute gift. For me too, Tom. Cheers.